Okay. Well, th thank you very much for having me. It's always a nice opportunity to present research and, and what I'm thinking about. Um, I want to talk about um, the healthy issues emerging with uh, genomic sequencing in care of critically ill children um, and, and why I think they have ramifications greater than just in the intensive care unit. Um, so I think everyone who works in the ethics space realizes that and knows it's, it's a truism that there is a, a gap between um, what people often say they will do in hypothetical contexts and what they actually do when faced with um, real decisions in the real world. Um, and this is, this is particularly true for ethical issues, um, things with end of life care. This is a piece by um, uh, Dr. Lamas uh, just a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times talking about someone changing their mind about do not, their do not intubate status. Um, and it makes research in this space um, for, for us difficult. Um, uh, and I think more so difficult for us than others, because obviously survey research uh, is based around the idea, you know, predicting who will be the next presidential pr president um, is based around the idea that people can use survey tools to, um, hypothetical survey tools to identify what people will subsequently do. Um, it's been talked about within our subfield, the LC subfield in genomics, um, this by uh, Dr. Clayton's piece, uh, talking about how we need to ask better questions, that, that pursuing too much of the hypothetical can be problematic and that we should wait um, until things can be empirically researched. Uh, I think that's important, but I think there are some questions like people's decisions around end of life care that we simply can't uh, hypothetically, uh, I mean, practically research because you can't ask them afterwards, um, rarely can you. And um, uh, also because simply the data is, is very tough to, to get. So this is the uh, BabySeq study, their piece from 2018, in which they explicitly talked about that, that their initial enroll enrollment predictions were based on a hypothetical project similar to the BabySeq project that our group previously reported on, where nearly 85% of the parents who they approached in the Brigham Women Hospital Well Baby Nursery were, were at least somewhat interested in the hypothetical possibility of having their newborn sequenced. Um, however, when they actually started the project, their enrollment rate was significantly lower. Um, part of this has to do, when you look at the philosophy and cognition literature, has to do with the context and contextual factors that are difficult to ascertain within, within hypothetical scenarios. Um, so this is, I want to talk about some of, the, some of the contextual factors that are influencing people's perception of genomics and biodata and precision medicine. This is last year's report from the Director of National Intelligence. I don't want to call out or vilify China uniquely, but this is their report talking about their concerns regarding China amassing huge amounts of biodata, particularly on American citizens, for whom they already have biodata on about 85% of the American population. And some of the questions are, are why? Uh, and they point out just the tremendous uh, financial viability of this data. Um, we also know that there are multinational corporations that are pers actively pursuing the idea of monetizing genomic information um, and seeing ways in which you submitting uh, data to them can be converted into to additional profit margins. Um, others have called out concerns about this during the COVID testing, that, that COVID swabs um, by certain companies can be used to also genomically sequence you, not only just to identify whether or not you have COVID. And I think that the, the, the main point is that neither these uh, different nation states or multinational corporations really reflexively adhere to the Athenian ethics filtered through the British and American centuries that we have come to embrace within American healthcare, or at least within our field. Um, and I think we've already seen these things start to go wrong. And we've seen other nation states view um, violations of our privacy or what many of us would view as violations of privacy and use of, of personal data as fundamental to their state security. Um, similarly, we've seen multinational corporations use what many of us would consider personal information as fundamental to their profit margin and maintaining their market share. And I think that's led to uh, overall uncomfort with big data. Um, this is just from Friday's New York Times. I, there's people who have participated in, in, in biobanking for research talking about how uncomfortable they are when biobanks contact them to inform them about genomic risk factors that they've been identified for. Um, and, and it talks about things that you would expect, um, concerns about life insurance, about health insurance, about employability, about um, uh, justice and law enforcement, safety and security of relatives. Um, so within the critical care space, my research, 
One of the things that was surprising in the research with implementing genomic sequence to the care of critically ill kids, particularly those with congenital heart disease, has been that the primary benefit of um, genomic sequencing as perceived by clinicians was that we could, this is a neonatologist saying that we could have that discussion with the parents and change our goals of care to comfort as opposed to prolongation with futile intensive care. Now clinicians saw great value in helping very difficult decisions around rationing, withdrawal of care and earlier declarations of futility. Um, this is borne out in, in national surveys that we've done of clinicians. This is uh, clinicians uh, around the country caring for children with congenital heart disease who were presented with a variety of genomic findings, and it altered their likelihood of recommending surgical palliation, um, ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is a heart-lung bypass rescue device, um, or transplantation. Um, for intellectual disability, for autism, for childhood onset cancer syndromes, and even for breast cancer. Um, and these were all scenarios drawn from our interview studies as, as things that had been brought up by interviewees. Um, similarly, for, for complex congenital heart lesions like Tetralogy of Fallot with pulmonary atresia and MAPCAs, um, which involves multiple, often multiple stage repairs, um, it can sometimes track with the DeGeorge syndrome, which can track with a severe schizophrenia, um, the, the severity which is difficult to predict. And clearly genomic sequencing results that, that provided some suggestion of, of severe schizophrenia altered clinicians' likelihood of recommending ECMO or transplantation in these children. Um, this trickles down to parents' perceptions of genomic sequencing. We did a follow-up study interviewing parents who have had children with congenital heart disease who underwent genomic sequencing or genetic testing. And these are quotes. Uh, they've spent probably over $4 million on him just on the two years of the transplant, pre-transplant, post everything. And if we had known about his mutation, his genes being bad, if we had known about it in advance, I always think, what if they had declined to treat him? If there's pre-existing conditions or the potential for conditions to come up in the future, how much does a medical institution invest in helping somebody that's potentially gonna die? Or this parent explicitly, we see distrust across the board in all of our institutions. You see it with the measles outbreak and the anti-vaxxers. There's distrust of pharmaceutical companies. There's distrust of the mega industry of healthcare. That will get worse and more intense with genome, genome testing. And I think when we first started doing this work, um, many people who criticized it, well, not many, but those who criticized it felt that um, you know, critical care is a world into itself. And I think over the past two years, we've seen with the pandemic, um, I think, I submit to you, you don't have to believe it, but I submit to you that critical care in, in America is actually a, a microcosm for healthcare restraint across all of uh, American healthcare, or the tip of the spear, or whatever metaphor you want to use. But that things that erode trust there, we have now seen a tremendous erosion in trust as we have dealt with resource constraint across America through this pandemic. And that has... Um, significant implications for the healthcare that people get. Their willingness to participate in diagnostic testing, to undertake recommended therapies um, when they're put forward, or even to engage forthrightly with the healthcare system. And I don't think that, that our use of information within the healthcare system is solely to blame. I, I, clearly there are multiple factors, as here the CDC notes. Um, social media clearly has a, has a tremendous role in um, uh, amplifying and polarizing uh, moral and ethical ambiguities. Um, but I think that a growing distrust is gonna prove very problematic for our ability to implement new therapies, particularly expanded genomic testing in, in children, because it does rely on a generation of children and families being willing to undergo testing in order for us to generate the data to be able to allow genomic sequencing to fulfill its predictive and prognostic power. Um, the hope that everyone has placed in it as a therapy. And so I think that this erosion of trust is important, is important to note out. And so I wanna dig into that a little bit more deeply and dig into my research a little more deeply. Um, uh, David Magnus, uh, one of my research mentors, um, likes to ride me and say that I had a little bit of a charmed path um, to my NHGRIK uh, award. I, I think that that's true. Um, I was put on the ethics committee and was one of just a very few clinicians on the committee. At, at the time and, and issues of genomic sequencing were starting to be brought up. And, and I asked questions around genomic sequencing that I think would be practical for a clinician. How am I gonna use this information at bedside that just because of the dearth of clinicians, the questions were not as, were, were not as prominent. Um, and so we put forward a piece into Lancet asking some of these questions about, well, if I use genomic testing, won't it 
move me in a direction maybe that I was already thinking. If, if, if a child is identified with predictive power from genomic tests to be, have a lesion that's unlikely to be long-term survivable, will that influence my thinking? Um, I'm not the first person to call this out. There's a term for it, um, self-fulfilling prophecies in healthcare. This is Dominic Wilkinson work, who's a neonatologist at the Oxford hospitals. Um, but the idea is this um, latent bias that, that once you identify an outcome as very likely that consciously or unconsciously clinical interventions begin to be tailored towards this particular outcome. Um, some of the questions we asked were around what impact should um, having a genomic predisposition to neurocognitive delay have on pursuing acute therapies in a child with respiratory failure um, that has a major side effect of neurocognitive damage? Should allocation of an organ be impacted by genomic sequencing revealed knowledge of a potential for a later onset debilitating disease? Should a child revealed by genomic sequencing to be more responsive to acute medicines receive more aggressive intervention than a child potentially less responsive? Um, and all of this occurs within the context of critical care, where, where the benefit to burden ratio is often very, very tight. Um, in my own subfield of congenital heart disease, it's a known truism that we have difficulty doing randomized controlled trials for therapies because, say, for like surgical techniques in these, these lesions, uh, it's very rare for us at year four or five after we've introduced the technique to really be doing them the same way and often entirely in the same population as at year one. And so the bedside clinician is really struggling with this idea of these very expensive techniques, um, uh, these interventions that are scarce. I mean, I've already mentioned things like organs for transplant, which are scarce, but also things like ECMO, the ECMO machines, which are scarce, and simply the bedside in an ICU, the providers, the respiratory therapists, the bedside nurses, the physicians, all of those are, are scarce resources to be had. And so trying to decide whether the application of these resources are helping and these therapies are improving outcomes or simply prolonging needless suffering is very much um, always in the forefront of the clinician's mind. Um, we already know from prior LC research that there are risks to undergoing genomic sequencing in the pediatric population. Some of the big ones that have been called out are parental perceptions of child vulnerability, impact on parent-child bonding, impact on parental self and partner blame, Project, protecting a child's right to an open future, to live their life un, unencumbered by perceptions of what they will be or won't be, impact of direct consumer genomic testing on family health anxiety and health behaviors. And I think the, impl the implementation of genomic sequencing raises some additional concerns and, and that the risk may be more stark in critically ill children, particularly those with cardiac diseases and potential transplant recipients, that the results may be used to justify declarations of utility, withdrawal of care, or rationing of scarce resources. Whether this is a benefit or burden may vary by patient and clinical context. It's obviously a use of precision medicine um, that, though precise, isn't uh, how it's plugged in the adverts of the benefit of precision medicine, um, and that this could have um, be very negatively perceived by the larger population if we don't put guardrails in place to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, uh, in fact, uh, this is now borne out to fulfill Dr. Clayton's concerns. This has now been borne out in actual implementations of genomic sequencing. This is from the Kingsmore group, this Laurel Willig's article from 2015, but several of their articles have shown that, that implementation of genomic sequencing and care of critically ill infants in the NICU, in the neo neonatal ICU, have shown initiation of palliative care to be most often identified as the clinical utility of genomic testing more than any other clinical action. Um, there are other factors that influence the, this context. The number of geneticists and genetic counselors in North America are really inadequate to address clinical use of genomic sequencing results for all patients who receive findings. This is, this is a known problem within our LC research community. Um, with time pressures common in critical care, the burden of interpreting and contextualizing genomic sequencing really does fall on the bedside clinician, um, despite the known limited knowledge and understanding of genetics and genomics that bedside clinicians have. And similar to how ICU physicians are required to make clinical decisions from other complex diagnostic tests, like reading x-rays or CT scans in traumas um, without radiology support, because of the clinical time pressures involved, that's likely to happen with some of the genomic sequencing. Though there is obviously effort, you and Ashley at Stanford, among others, the Kingsmore group at San Diego, working to give return of results with overreading um, for the clinical, the clinical question within just a few hours. Um, 
We know that clinicians do make rationing decisions from genetic findings. Um, pediatric solid, this is Richard's work, pediatric solid organ transplant programs do use genetic findings associated with developmental delay, such as fragile X to guide at organ allocation. Um, most clinicians would withhold uh, ECMO in children with trisomy 13 or 18 and would consider trisomy 21 as a relative contraindication. Um, for high-risk surgery, such as for hypoplastic left heart syndrome, clinicians do use the presence of chromosomal defects to steer care away from interventions. Um, to try and understand the impacts of genomic sequencing in pediatric critical care, particularly for children with congenital heart disease, we undertook an interview study to examine how clinicians caring for children with CHD anticipated and perceived genomic sequencing. We interviewed 34 clinicians and three themes emerged. The first was around uncertainty re regarding genomic sequencing, testing and accuracy and adequacy of the validations. The biggest single challenge for us technically when we get in the world of exome and genome sequencing is to apply what's standard in the rest of medicine, the idea of non-inferiority. We're not going to accept the new test until it's non-inferior to the current test. The second is the use of genomic sequencing on life-limiting decisions. So for us, we've seen this quote, one of the more immediate benefits is changing to comfort as opposed to prolongation with intent futile intensive care. This another clinician, we already know that about 25% of kids with DeGeorge syndrome, the 22Q11 deletion, get schizophrenia, and they get tetralogy of Fallot with pulmonary atresia mapcas. It's a horrible surgery that's probably not going to go very well. Wouldn't you want to know about the schizophrenia as early as possible before you do the surgery? The implication being that you would withhold the surgery or at least make that uh, the schizophrenia a significant part of the consent discussion. Um, I also the impacts on prenatal testing in these children. I think if my daughter were getting pregnant and had that screening and found that her fertilized egg carried the 22Q11 deletion, I think I'd probably say, you know, why don't we try again, but with the understanding that that could be a totally normal kid. This sounds more paternalistic, but knowing that your little girl who's in utero has the breast cancer gene, I mean, that is useful. Maybe try again and you get a girl that doesn't have the breast cancer gene. Obviously, these are extensions beyond uh, prior uses of uh, genetic findings for significant developmental delay. Um, distress over using genomic sequencing with lack of decision support or even full understanding of it. Um, whole genome sequencing is somewhat of a new world where we get really information on so many diseases. This is a situation where you're not just seeing an image of one organ, you're getting an individual base pair sequence for every gene and potentially that could be relevant for every disease, every organ. I, I think that's the major challenge to process. And this from a neonatologist, I have the dubious distinction of probably being the only person that puts someone with a particular genetic finding associated with a poor outcome on ECMO. Maybe it's not my position to say that those resources were wasted, but it concerns me that literally hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent and this child had a modest prolongation of life and a lot of suffering in the hospital, perhaps more for the parent's sake than for the child's sake. Um, to try and see if these findings were, uh, could be extrapolated more broadly, we undertook a couple national surveys. The first one was of pediatric transplant programs to confirm these interview findings. Um, we surveyed the pediatric transplant programs that did liver, kidney, heart transplant. 69 of the 163 programs in the United States responded. 64 of these percent of these programs have required genetic testing and the pre-transplant evaluation based on specific clinical indications. 16% of them have required it irrespective of clinical indications. Um, hereditary cancers uh, as relative contraindication to listings. 8% felt that for hereditary breast cancer, BRCA1, and 61% for leaf from many, the um, TB53, 17% of programs would use a positive predictive testing for Huntington's disease as a relative contraindication to listing for transplant. And some programs would consider a positive genetic test results to be absolute contraindications, 5% for leaf from many and 5% for Huntington's. Um, we also did a national survey of clinicians caring for children with heart disease, as I noted before, to look at their questions about their use and experience with genomic sequencing. We presented scenarios based on our interview findings. Uh, one involved an infant girl with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Another involved a 12-year-old boy with tetralogy of Fallot, pulmonary atresia, and MACCAs. <clears throat> for each scenario, some physicians read genomic sequencing that it indicated high probability of developing other conditions in the future. We randomly selected 50 hospitals from a list of the 157 United States hospitals that treat children with heart disease. Um, the list was created from US News World Report, um, Society of Thoracic Surgeons, Wikipedia. Um, two, about 2,000 physicians met inclusion criteria. We sampled 630 of these clinicians and got a little, just shy of a 30% response rate, which is, par, um, <clears throat> which is on par with response rate for other busy clinicians. Um, so this is the table of the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Um, 
in which uh, childhood onset cancer syndrome did impact the likelihood of recommending surgical palliation or transplantation. Developmental delay, which was known, impacted all of these. And severe autism also impacted the likelihood of surgical palliation. Um, I also noted this. What is of note is um, obviously these are, are problematic. They, they extend, um, you know, severe developmental delay has been known for a time to impact um, recommendations of scarce resources. Um, autism is an extension of that. Similarly, um, it, it might be reasonable to not offer an organ for transplantation to a child with a childhood onset cancer syndrome because of the known uh, acceleration of cancer syndromes with the immunosuppressive therapies that go with transplantation. However, you know, the parents uh, the child would likely want to prolong life as long as possible. So not recommending ECMO or, or surgical palliation um, may not make sense within this context and may warrant some discussion. Um, we also interviewed families who had undergone genomic sequencing in the pediatric care context and, and had children with congenital heart disease to see how they perceived and anticipated the impacts of genomic sequencing on their decision-making and treatment recommendations. Um, Similar interview study, we interviewed 35 families uh, and, and coded, this is uh, Dana Gall and Natalie Deutsch, um, who are at Cincinnati Children's and uh, NHGRI now, respectively. Um, the interview content was around previous experiences with an understanding of genetic testing, perceptions towards genetics, genome sequencing in real and hypothetical scenarios, and thoughts about implementing genomic sequencing in clinical care. Uh, several themes emerged. The first was whether the knowledge was beneficial to the care of their child. Families did see benefit uh, in genomic sequencing, the ability to provide specific and or earlier diagnoses, to clarify prognoses, to change family planning, to avoid unnecessary additional testing. Um, but they also struggled, many of the families, with the sense that genomic sequencing results didn't in fact guarantee meaningful changes to their child's clinical care. Um, if there were other issues, I wanted to be prepared how to help him. We want to be prepared for how the best to be the best parents and make sure he gets the best care once he's born, not just for his heart, but for everything else. Like, is he going to make it to 18? We wanted to prepare ourselves for that. Personally, I only want to know the things that we need to work on to get better. Like if there's potential that he could sprout an extra toe, I don't care. But if his genome tells us which path we need to take for his medical care, I, I want to know. Um, there was disagreement among parents as to whether genomic sequencing should guide life-limiting decisions and resource allocation. There were concerns about genetic discrimination, um, but some parents did feel that genomic sequencing was an important tool to ensure appropriate allocation of scarce resources. Um, I think the medical community should do what they can for everybody, not just the genetically healthy ones or the ones who don't have any flaws. I think that's discriminatory, hugely. Um, conversely, that makes sense to me, it really does. My son got a heart, so if he had been a bad genome person, then maybe he wouldn't have gotten a heart. But I do understand it, an organ going to the best candidate and healthiest, unless I guess you could say genetically healthy. Um, universally, so, so the question whether giving results to the healthcare system is safe, universally families indicated mistrust of at least one facet of the medical system, whether it was insurance companies, our ability to maintain privacy and confidentiality, the incentive structure in healthcare or direct to consumer genome sequencing testing. Insurance companies, they've got their own mind. Um, People don't have control over what they've genetically inherited, and I don't feel that they should be penalized through their insurance or otherwise because of that. If there's pre-existing conditions or the potential for conditions to come up in the future, how much does a medical institution invest in helping somebody that's potentially going to die? These private companies, are they going to sell this data to insurance companies? In this day and age, with everyone's data up in the cloud, you talk to a hacker and he goes, oh, it's inevitable. Your stuff's going to get hacked eventually. Um, we as a healthcare institution are, are not um, proving to be spectacular stewards of personal information. Um, the, the sale of de-identified data is, is, this is Nigam Shaw, a colleague of mine, Stanford's work, um, it is a multi-billion dollar industry at this point. I mean, and Nigam, among others, have demonstrated how, how very, very easy it is to re-identify de-identified healthcare data, particularly if you have a large enough cashment and have multiple data sources that you can triangulate with. Um, and that this data is being sold quite broadly um, with, with, concerning, with concerning results um, from uh, pharmaceutical companies targeting particular physicians with prescribing practices to um, uses that have yet to be fully identified, but targeting uh, drug therapies or um, economic therapies or you name it. Um, 
interestingly, among our, our interviews with, with families, um, Gina didn't come up. Uh, very few of the families were even worried, uh, were even aware of the Genomic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, and that, that speaks, I think, both to it, it, important publicity that needs to occur around that, but also the fact that these now resale uses of de-identified data, which are being purchased by health insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, the purveyors of healthcare, um, seem to have largely circumvented, um, at least in public perception, HIPAA and GINA. Um, I think that the concerns I raise are not unique to genomic sequencing. Um, genomic sequencing is a big data field, and so all of the related big data fields, from big data itself to AI tools being applied to healthcare, to precision medicine, to the rise of learning health systems, all have these similar um, ethical concerns. Um, my particular focus being around the erosion of trust um, and how important that is between uh, patients uh, and, and the healthcare systems that are providing them with healthcare. Uh, and I want to thank everyone who has contributed to this, this research effort. Um, thank you. Thank you all for having me come talk. Thank you so much, Danton. Um, maybe we can stop sharing us. Yeah, great. Um, this seems like such a, if you'll excuse the expression, critical place where Elsie resides. I mean, it really seems like where the rubber meets the road as far as making clinical decisions based on genomic information. Um, I'm sure we will have quest more questions, but let me just start things off by asking you, what is what kind of genomic findings are being used for prediction in this area now? Is it path? I mean, it seems to me that it makes a big difference whether you're talking about pathogenic variants with a major effect or where you're talking, for example, about polygenic risk scores. You're absolutely right. The answer is both. Um, so some of my hypothetical scenarios clearly simplified it, right? There, there isn't uh, one genomic finding that identifies the severity of risk for DeGeorge associated schizophrenia. I mean, there isn't really to my yeah. knowledge, as when we did anything for schizophrenia, there, there are multi-gene risk scores I think that people have, but it is something that has come up uh, in multiple interviews with clinicians as something that they wish they had and would impact their thinking. Um, I, I think less than the individual findings, um, more the context of having to um, allocate scarce resources to the right child has created a situation of tremendous pressure within the intensive care context, and, and as I submit to you, all of American healthcare, um, and that people are looking for anything that can help guide them. So it, it is all ge genetic genomic findings and anything that's predictive. I think the same will begin to emerge with predictive risk scoring from AI big data. Similarly, that, yeah. that anything that will suggest an outcome that could support an uncomfortable, a, a morally and ethically difficult and uncomfortable decision that the bedside provider is left with. Um, I'm answering, I'm sorry, this is a long answer to your question. Right. Other questions? Um, I see positive feedback in the chat here. Oh. Um, and you can uh, just unmute yourself if you have a question. Eric, I see you've unmuted. And Leah just texted something. I hope I said that right. Le Leah just texted to the chat too about uh, um, healthcare rationing. Um, yeah, Leah, that's a great question. Um, and, and, I, and I think it, it's very complicated. And I think it, it, it is the same as probably what we're seeing in the intensive care unit um, that it, it's been often spoken about over the past year and a half. Probably you guys have all heard it in these discussions about, oh, you know, the, the poor bedside clinician who has to decide who gets an ICU ventilator um, in the context of COVID. And it is a poor bedside clinician. I don't mean to undersell that. But I also think that the decision around whether or not who gets a ventilator was also made by the C-suite class five years before the pandemic hit us um, or even during the pandemic. And so in many ways, clinicians are finding themselves as the tip of a very long supply chain spear that they didn't manufacture, but are having to, to make these tough decisions. And anything that can help offload the burden on them of this difficult decision, I think, is, <clears throat> is what they're seeking. Yeah. Um, 
So that one comes near and dear to my heart being an anesthesiologist. Of course, yeah. Um, when I started in training, we had these warehouses of, of ventilators. They were out of date, it's true, but they still worked and we had to go down and, and work on them to learn our training. Those have all been cleared away to make space for other things in the hospital, but if we had had them, we wouldn't have run out of ventilators. So I, it's a source of some bitterness to me. Eric? Sorry, Eric. Thanks very much for uh, a, a, a lovely survey of an incredibly complicated terrain. Um, this is really just a process question. Um, I think in one of your sentences, you mentioned um, three terms, uh, futility, uh, rationing, and selective termination, um, each of which, as you well know, um, are can be areas of great concern, um, especially for people with disabilities. And I'm just wondering if thus far you have been engaging people with disabilities in, in your conversations about how these findings are being used. It's a, it's a great question and you're absolutely right to call me out. Um, we, I wasn't calling you out, I was <laughs> asking a question. To, to, to ask and pursue that, um, you were absolutely right. We, we have been doing so. Um, because of the nidus of a lot of the decision making has been at the parents level, we had been um, interfacing and have been involving parents on our research team, um, family councils and stuff, who are often the parents of children who have had such disabilities. But um, um, many of the disabilities that I have encountered in my care context have not yet been survivable to adulthood or to a majority to participate in this. So we, we had not engaged with adult. It, whether there is benefit in, in engaging with the disability community in and of itself around this research is a fair question, but I have not. I would think that might be useful, especially in this moment when I think many people with disabilities for good reason have grown impatient with deference to the parents of children with disabilities as opposed to people with disabilities. You've explained why people with disabilities with the conditions you're interested in wouldn't, aren't around to help, but you get my point. Yeah, no, no, and you're, and you're right. And it, it cer certainly before any policy, I mean, I, I guess if I have a stump that I'm stumping in this talk, it's that, that we need, to, we, the healthcare community need to do a better job of coming up with a transparent um, and compassionate policy about how we're gonna use genomic information. And I think certainly that community needs to be part of any policy discussion that we would, we would have and the transparency inherent to it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Other comments? I think the question of, uh, you know, using genomics to make care decisions obviously goes beyond the critical care context too. I work in the field of epilepsy. And when people first see a physician for epilepsy, the physician says, well, I know that two thirds of people will respond to treatment and the other third won't, but I have no idea how this person is going to, to evolve in their, in their illness. And you know they're desperate to find ways of predicting. So, I mean, you, you really highlight the, the quandary of, of the physicians here. And of course, the quandary of the families too, but. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I don't, and I don't mean to, um, you know, I probably slip on the word and keep talking about the physicians, but the truth is it's, it's all the allied health providers, everybody who's at bedside having to make some decision yeah. um, who's joining this. Yeah. Alexis. Yeah, hi, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I, um, I'm faculty in the D Division of Ethics in the Department of Medical and Humanities and Ethics here on, and an STS scholar, so glad to have you. Um, I was you know, trying to piece together my, my words. So you, know, you focus on the idea that this kind of rationing based on genetics is um, gonna undermine trust in the healthcare system. And I'm gonna you know, maybe ask a little bit of an unfair question, which is that you don't go too much into where you sit as an analyst in, in terms of how you judge what, whether this kind of rationing is un unjust. Um, and I wondered if you maybe would be willing to speak to that at all. Um, Cause for me, it felt like you were arguing, you know, the main problem is that it's gonna undermine trust, not that it's um, 
fundamentally unjust in and of itself, but maybe that is what you were arguing. So I'd love to hear a little bit more on that and how you sort of see some of these concerns about if the argument is, you know, genetics is not, um, you know, the the levels of, you know, um, that uh, Ruth was getting at, maybe the penetrance levels or the uh, fidelity of the information is not sufficient to make this decision. It, is that, you know, how does it weigh, how do you, how do you see it weighing against the financial concerns that, um, you know, that are real? No, unless it's a great question. I mean, maybe that's the question um, with this stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's several, several questions that I would have an answer. One is exactly what you asked, which is, um, do, do the variant classification, is the variant classification outcome data strong enough to actually support these uses? Do we actually know that just because we have a finding, it, it means that this will happen? That's the concern about the self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, I, I cared for a kid just um, a few years ago now who was from another country who had trisomy 18, which I had been taught in medical school was universally fatal in the first year of life, except this kid was like 12. Now, granted, once we sequenced him, it was, there was mosaicism and variable penetration, but it raised this question of, you know, to what degree are we playing to our pre-existing prejudices and how good is the data for the outcome? So I think that's, that's part of it. But the, the flip side is we won't get that data if we don't successfully enroll an entire generation. I mean, this is the all of us work. Is the truth is we need huge amounts. Russ, Russ Altman, um, at, who's at Stanford, likes to say that even if we had the genome sequence of every person who's ever lived, we still wouldn't get to p-values less than 0.5 for non-Mendelian inheritance patterns. And so we're going to need a huge amount of buy-in to provide this data to actually fulfill this promise of predictive, predictive power from it. Um, and so uses like I'm encountering are, are inevitable. Um, and, and clearly, if, if such outcomes are to be found, care probably should be withdrawn, to leave someone in the ICU lingering in a liminal space with no hope of ever being discharged is not a kindness to a child. Um, and, and I think what we need to figure out is how we have this intelligent town, national town hall conversation about that this is going to be. And I think what one of the blowbacks with genomic sequencing that's so challenging is, so the baby seek people, you have your healthy neonate sequenced at birth and that sequence travels with the child and then four, five, eight years later, your child gets diagnosed with a cardiomyopathy and is in heart failure and has to get a transplant. And the findings from that sequence have ramifications as to whether or not you get a heart. And, and we need to make sure that that's transparent, that there isn't blowback, that that doesn't deter people's participation. Um, I, I think we've all seen in a very brutal way that, that the distancing and the poor messaging from the healthcare system during the pandemic have led to people to be you know, more likely to believe what they find on the internet at two in the morning than they are to believe what, what their doctor and the CDC says. And, and, and we just have to circumvent that. It's, it's not unique to genomics, um, but I, I'm seeing it in the gen genomic use in the ICU space. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Thanks. I have another question, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, yeah, so, sorry. No, you're fine. So you talked earlier about the idea of palliative care as the sort of decision, or I guess I'll preface this by, I have more background in genetics. I'm currently a med student about to finish up my medical side, but I'm more familiar with like the genetic variant analysis. So you talked about the idea of palliative care as the kind of decision made more often in the NICU. I guess my two-part question and baby seek sort of get, addresses this, but how much do you think that has to do with who has been getting these tests still? And then on the other side of it, I mean, my guess is if you ask any geneticist who's doing a lot of variant analysis, what's the likelihood any test out there for anyone is going to make a clinical a change in clinical decision-making? My guess is a geneticist would give us a would think there's less of a chance it would make a difference than a non-geneticist right now. And how much do you think that either do you agree or disagree with that? And then how much do you think uh, that plays into this? Um, those are great questions. Great question. So, so in answer to the first one that you put forward, yes, absolutely. The child who is flying through and meets all of discharge criteria um, is not going to get sequenced unless they get sequenced as part of one of these broader attempts at implementing sequencing for everybody, right? So, but, but targeted testing is obviously the child who is not thriving, who maybe looks atypical, who is having multi-organ in, involvement in some way, right? So you're absolutely right. So, so that, and, and, and um, you know, the, 
where the therapy is, where the clinicians are falling on the burden to benefit ratio probably varies from child to child, but whether the findings could then allow clinicians to say, okay, we, we've done what we can do, we will, and whether it's ready to be that catalyst or whether the burden of that uncomfort still needs to ride on the clinician's shoulders um, is, is, un, is unclear to me um, and is a good question. Um, was that, I'm sorry, now in, on my digression, I forgot your second half of your question. Um, I think you also just asked, answered the second half of the question, the idea of where the burden of the discomfort should lie and uh, sort of how that relates to both the not geneticists versus non-geneticist clinicians. Oh, it was the issue of therapeutic advance, right? So a lot of healthcare, right, we get better in small, small, tiny steps, but there are also moments of punctuated equilibrium, you know, like there's much that's been written about the HIV physicians and how horrible they felt of letting patients go in the winter of 1993 and then by the spring of 1994 having retrovirals and all of a sudden the same patients who they would have let go two months before were now all of a sudden coming back to life, right? So we've had those things and that's uncomfortable. I exist in a field that's very like that where we have gone from this horrible, horrible disease to now being largely one of healthcare's great success stories. Um, and so the idea of, of, is this child the child who we will make a therapeutic advance on rides very largely in the minds of all of my co-clinicians. Co and, and that's infused the spirit, right, rightly or wrongly, whether that optimism is, is, is false and leads to a false hope is, is a fair question and concern. But, but the other balance is that, is to make sure that self-fulfilling prophecies don't um, quell the opportunity to actually do better because we can only predict the future based on what we knew yesterday, if that makes that cute little phrasing make sense. I can't resist saying that in another example of that is the COVID pandemic and how things have changed since the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Well, I sort of hate to do this, but uh, as in the absence of anybody else speaking up, I'll mention that we saw yeah. this also um, in uh, rationing with regards to hepatitis C med medication. I, I published a piece a couple of years ago with some colleagues, I'll put it in the, in the chat on the ethics of precision rationing is what we called it. And um, there the, the several you know, papers being used to suggest, but it looked like it wasn't happening yet. But so this is interesting, you know, it's interesting to see in your arena where it's really happening as opposed to in the hep C case where, you know, the drugs are really expensive and, um, and not based on, you know, not based on the genetics of the viral strain, but on um, host genetics were being offered as a suggestion to say the folks who are less likely to clear well on, um, uh, you know, not the standard of, uh, well, basically everybody really should get the good drugs, right? And that, but that, you know, they're, they're really expensive. So you look like maybe you do okay on the, on the like drugs that have terrible side effects. Like maybe we could put you on those because the other drugs are expensive. And, and that was being proposed in a lot of papers that we found. So anyway, um, yeah, this comes up certainly across, across arenas. Mm -hmm. No, no, I think you're right. I mean, I think something we do very bad in the LC community is extrapolate from other contexts of saying, you know, I mean, it comes up all the time with the AI stuff of, of people saying, well, well, just because, just because things have gone so badly with social media, that doesn't mean that that's what'll happen with, you know, use of big data within healthcare. And you think, well, but, but our job is to try and anticipate horrible things before they happen and prevent them. So if we've seen it happen so largely here, why wouldn't we think it would at least be something to worry about in this other context? So I, I completely agree with you. Thank you. I worry I didn't say enough provocative things. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, we have another comment in the chat here. Um, Parents and clinicians views can vary significantly. How much of these different opinions be taken into account in ICU when there's conflict of opinion? Oh, that's a great question. Helen, that's a great question. Um, so th I think that, yeah, I, there are a bunch of ways to answer this. I think one I would go for is, um, one of the challenges we have is, you know, we, we've come to exist in a world of quality metrics as to what is a good outcome, what is a bad outcome. And in many ways, what constitutes good is that which is easily measurable and easily quantifiable. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right that there are whole spectrums of outcomes which are only accessible by qualitative 
pursuit, which is hard and time consuming. Um, and I think we probably have played too much to um, an easily achievable tick box of good outcome without pursuing what might be good for many. Um, for, for my field, the overshadow for all this is the extreme prematurity. Um, where, where there was a lot of pushback about resuscitating these children who had severe multi-organ disease but no longer required intensive, intensive care and sending them home with families that really were overwhelmed in caring for this, this medically very, very complex child and had no understanding of what they were, were getting into. And it was, as you point out, very heterogeneous um, whether families appreciated that outcome or, or felt unbelievably burdened and their life changed in an, in an inexorable way. Um, or both, um, and, and there was no consensus. So I don't have an easy answer for you. I have a question as well. That was a really great talk. I have a um, wondering you. two things. One is um, you focused only on young kids or also on older kids. And I'm just wondering, again, distinction between prenatal or you know, neonatal or kids who are very young versus teenagers, for example, and then again, their perspectives and their parents' perspective once they already have become really attached to children. And then the other question that I had was whether you had any sense of the moral distress of clinicians who are, have to be involved in these type of decisions, if you've assessed it in any way. I think these are, you know, sometimes really life and death decisions. And so uh, how do they feel about using genomics as the criteria and how does that impact their care, their empathy, their ability to sustain it and so forth? Um, so, so those are two great questions, um, which I just sort of have touched on, but not well, not at the level that I think you would, you would want to. Um, uh, no, I lumped, I lumped all the groups together and I did kind of cheat a little bit in the talk. I included some of the prenatal quotes because I thought they were particularly provocative, um, but that is a little bit of a different, a different world than a child who was already 16 or 17. Um, regarding the moral distress, it's very high in this population. Um, we know from internal QI that um, consistently the, our cohort is, is the lowest um, and the most unhappy of clinicians. Um, it's wor worse during the pandemic. Um, and we've seen it in other things. We, we did a survey of looking at, um, this is Beth, Beth Kaplan's work um, uh, with Seth Holliner, looking at a deactivation of ventricular assist devices in children with with uh, congenital heart disease and heart failure. Um, and there's clearly very, very high moral distress. Even when, when the family has requested it, about 70% of clinicians refuse to do it because they find the fallout, the emotional fallout from doing so to be too, too high to bear. So, but I don't have direct stuff for genomic information and the, more, the specific moral distress. It came up in the, in the interviews, but I didn't submit the transcripts to any sort of moral distress uh, scale or evaluation. Thank you. Yeah, it was a great question. Thank you. I think there's another question in the chat mm. from Leah. I didn't see it. Sorry, Leah. It, only if there aren't others. Go oh. ahead, Leah. Do you want to say your question? Sure. Yeah. So the question is just. Uh, Given the cost of some of the precision drugs, thinking of both the hepatitis C example and SMA drugs, is there anything we can do to get cost out of the equation of determining how genetic findings influence care? Um, trying to, I'm having a little bit of a middle-aged brain freeze. There's a, somebody in Europe who's been looking at that, trying to look at different healthcare systems, um, but I can't remember her, her name right now. Um, of course, it'll come to me once the talk is over. Um, you know, in, in the American context, it's tough, right? We are a we are a zero sum game. It, it it is all about cost, and I and I think one of the chief problems we've seen over the past. I didn't include the slide in this talk, but there's a very good paper by Jerry Dew um, from like 2018, 2019, looking at just the explosion of spectacularly well compensated. Um, uh, healthcare administrators with no increase in the number of patients being cared for within healthcare systems. And um, just speaking to that, the fact that, and, and these people are needed for all the regular, the growth and regulations as required, but that there's a value collision there, that, that the goals of, of profit um, and profitability don't always align with the goals of the bedside clinician. They're not always at, at loggerheads, but, but that's clearly a challenge. 
Um, and, and it certainly comes up too now, even in things that are not explicitly pursuing costs, like in the AI space, talking about algorithmic fairness. Um, you know, one of the rebuttals to algorithmic fairness is to improve the outcome of a marginalized population is to, to detract from the benefits received by the majority population. And so how, how much you have to reduce one to increase the other and where the fairness point lies, it is literally it's great questions. Yeah. One last time, any further comments? Okay. So well, if not Ruth, before you thank Danton, um, and my apologies for being um, missing in action earlier, um, next month, uh, our uh, February seminar uh, will be on February 14th, Valentine's Day, and Shaniqua Collier from um, GW uh, in DC uh, will be here. Shaniqua has done a, a ton of work on, on issues related to diversity in genomics and all the, all the complications that uh, come from the lack of diversity in, in many of our uh, genomic uh, data sets. And we will get uh, the information out to you shortly about her uh, specific uh, title uh, of her of her talk, but that's February fourteenth uh, at noon. Uh, stay tuned for more information about that. Okay, thank you, Paul, and thank you very much, Denton, for a really stimulating com conversation about this topic. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Nice to meet you all. <clears throat> Thanks for the thank great you. questions. Thanks. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.